Hey Earl here and I'm honored to be interviewing my special guest today, Carl Levi. Carl was in the Chattanooga City Treasurer's Office for nearly 45 years. 25 years he served as Treasurer of the City of Chattanooga. He also was elected as Hamilton County Trustee to two terms. And when you start looking at his community activities, especially those with veterans, why the list is rather long. Uh, 65 years in the American Legion. Uh, served on the Armed Forces Week Committee. Actually, he marched in the first Armed Forces Day Parade and later on joined the committee that oversaw it. And just many, many more civic projects. And we're going to find out a little bit about Carl Levi today and all of his different veterans' activities. Carl, tell us first of all about how you got involved in that beautiful, beautiful memorial out at the National Cemetery. Uh, to all of our veterans and the different branches of service? Well, <clears throat> the Chattanooga Area Veterans Council uh, elected or appointed me the, the chairman to build a pavilion uh, when I wasn't there. So uh, I asked, uh, Bob LaHare was the chairman, I said, well now, what am I supposed to do? And he said, well, you're supposed to build a pavilion and then and raise the money and said, it's all in your hands. So. Uh, I, I had uh, four other people that helped me and we raised uh, $500,000 and uh, built the pavilion uh, with, uh, with a lot of help from uh, Senator um, uh, Fred Thompson who got the VA down to talk with us about it and they, they okayed the plans and said it was the only community in the country that had ever done that. So. Uh, we, we, we raised $500,000 and then the, uh, the Chattanooga Electric Power Board uh, donated the electricity and then we, we got a well digger to dig the, dig the well for us and so we would have water in the, in the ponds all the time. And so we, we sold this on the idea that it was a place to people to have their last committals but not only that, but for military organizations to come to Chattanooga and have a reunion. And it's, uh, so far it's worked out very good. They did promise us two new committal shelters out of that, and two years later they didn't. So my friend Joe Young and I, we just hopped on a plane and went to Washington and had a, we had a meeting with uh, Roger Rudd, who was in charge of all the national cemeteries in the United States. And he said, oh, he didn't know anything about it. And I said, well, would you look in your files and see if there's a letter there? Because I can't find mine. And in a minute he come back and he said, yeah, here it is. Says, we, we did promise that and said we're, we're committed. So that's how we got the two new committal shelters at the Chattanooga National Cemetery. Chattanooga National Cemetery has a, a, a place in my heart because there used to be Jackson uh, Jackson Park over there in the, in the southeast corner and uh, I used to play there because my mother worked 66 years at uh, Atlas Paper Box which is now Top Fight Paper Products and I learned to ride a bicycle there and then uh, when I was in high school uh, in the ROTC I guess uh, I helped bury probably 200 people coming back from uh, World War II and, uh, and, and uh, well, it was World War II. And, and so it, it's just been a, a, a place in my heart all these years. So Now you've been very active in veterans organizations and veterans causes. Uh, let's go back to how you got into the American Legion because I believe you've uh, served in the American Legion for what 65 plus years 67 67 how did you get interested in the American Legion how did that all well come about? I never heard of the American Legion and uh, I went to the uh, the service officer who happened to be Bookie Turner and uh, I was signing up to get the GI Bill to go back to the university and Bookie says, well, why don't you join the American Legion? And I said, what is it? And he told me, and he says, they got you the GI Bill. And I said, well, I'll join. Uh, I'll help pay back. And uh, back then, the, 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 the dues were only $6. And uh, Bob and the and I got to talking about it. And so uh, we found out they had a drum and bugle course. So we just joined the American Legion. 
Now your daddy told you though that uh, you needed to earn a few extra coins. So uh, did that was that connected with the Legion or was that connected with the National Guard? Oh, that was uh, National Guard. Uh, I was I was living at home. I was on the GI Bill and I was working for three lawyers and uh, I needed to make some extra money and uh, one of my fraternity brothers, Ed Jolly, says, well, they're looking for second lieutenants at the National Guard. And I said, well, what would you do? And he said, well, you'd be a forward observer. I didn't know what a forward observer was till I found out that uh, their life expectancy was about 15 to 30 minutes after you go to Korea. And they're the people that, that, that spot for the, for the artillery and then they, they shoot on the target. So uh, I went out, <clears throat> took the exam, and uh, two weeks later, uh, they commissioned me and uh, I, I, I got the butter bar on my shoulder and this was like in uh, 1955 and uh, I, I had, had intended to stay in long enough to retire as a captain and uh, good Lord was with me I, I, I did a little bit better than that thank goodness and Thanks to your good friend, Senator Ray Albright, I believe. Senator, Senator Ray Albright and Senator Ward Crutchfield got the, got the drill hall named after me. To start with, they, they got me $750,000 line item in the budget to remodel the, the drill hall. And uh, we, we poured concrete to start with, and then we got new windows and new doors. Uh, new uh, uh, ceiling, insulation in the ceiling. Uh, we got a new uh, stage. We, we didn't have uh, bathrooms for the, for the women. When I first joined, it was all men. So now we got uh, men's and women's bathrooms. We got a consolidated mess. Uh, we have a big, uh, big stage. And the warrant officer that was in charge of the, um, of the mess halls he said, uh, Colonel said, that'll never work. And I said, yeah, it will. He said, how are you going to make it work? I said, I'm going to put you in charge. So it, it worked. And uh, before, they had to eat either in the back end of a truck or they'd go into the drill hall where it was awful cold. So uh, we've got everything out there except air conditioning. We, we, do, we have heat in it. And you can, uh, in, in fact, uh, the Armed Forces folks used to uh, build their floats out there in the in the drill hall back uh, several years ago. Now your work in the National Guard and your work in the American Legion have gone hand in hand and that you've been able to use your affiliation with both of those organizations to push for uh, veterans causes. Yes I have and, and with my National Guard connections also my father was a deputy fire chief and uh, he said, wonder if we could get some of that military equipment. And I said, oh, I don't know, Dad, what do you need it for? And he said, well, we instead of taking one of these expensive fire engines out into the woods to fight a fire, I said, I'd like to get some, maybe some deuce and a half and five quarter ton trucks. So I said, well, uh, I think I, I know how to do that. So I, I got in touch with a friend and I said, uh, What's the possibility of getting uh, three deuce and a half and a couple of five quarter tons trucks for the fire department here in Chattanooga? And he said, uh, "How long? How how long? You how quick do you need them?" And I said, uh, "It's your call." And about two weeks later, he said, uh, "When can you meet us out on the interstate?" And I said, "Yeah." And so here come three army trucks and and two deuce and a half and a little van. And they, they pulled them into the garage, and um, I took them over to town and country and, and bought their lunch and filled up their van. And it cost the city, I think, uh, $25 for their lunch and uh, I think maybe $10 for gas. And my, my daddy took those, uh, took those deuce and a halves and he uh, reworked them and took the beds off and, and fabricated a uh, uh, a 12 gallon, 1200 uh, gallon tank and put baffles in it. Uh, he painted a red and white. He took the military tires off and put Michelin tires on it. And he took the 24 volt system off and made a 12 volt system. And they're still in operation. Now, uh, uh, in the National Guard, you went from second lieutenant to general. So you're done pretty good. 
Well, I went from corporal. Oh, you started out as corporal. I okay. started out as corporal, okay. yeah. And then just went up through the ranks. I was very fortunate. Very, very fortunate. All right, let's talk just a minute about the American Legion because some people that uh, our community will recognize their names uh, really were your good friends, and that was Charles Coolidge and, and, and Desmond Doss. Now, you joined the Legion in 1954 at the urging of Commissioner Turner. Uh, <clears throat> well, Commissioner Turner and... Uh, then I, and I ran into Charlie Coolidge too, uh, and one day somewhere, and Charlie says, "Well, why don't you come join us?" And I said, "Charlie, I, I don't know anything about it, but I did join it." And uh, uh, Charles Coolidge and Desmond Doss were both uh, members of, of American Legion Post 14, and, and I got to know them, and they were just regular guys. Uh, and, and just just as down to earth as they could possibly be. Now they had started the Armed Forces Week celebration in the parade, what six or seven years before you got involved in, in the 19, Legion. Nineteen forty nine. Okay, and you marched in that parade. I marched as in a the student city. city high school. I did. I sure did. And then you joined the Legion in nineteen fifty four, and it wasn't long till you were very involved, even going up to the <clears throat> commander of the post, I believe. Well, I was commander of the post, and then later on, I was the state commander. And then I came back and I was re-elected post commander and I stayed post commander for 28 years. And uh, on the state level, I've been the national executive committeeman and I'm very active on the national uh, level because I'm the, uh, the vice chairman of the National Finance Commission. And there are only seven of us and we handle all the money for the American Legion worldwide. And you are one of three individuals to get the the Tennessee Legionnaire Award right uh, from our post from yes. your post from right. post 14 and I see uh, Alan Seiler Alan is one of them and, and Speedy Bearden Speedy Bearden and, and yourself myself, right. mm -hmm. and, and so you've been the Tennessee Legionnaire of the Year and then I got the uh, Hamilton County uh, Veteran of the Year and uh, so did Johnny Popham Johnny Popham was the uh, managing editor of the, of the uh, Times and um, I put Johnny in for it, and so Joe Murphy called me one day, and he said, <clears throat> Johnny Popham won the Veteran of the Year Award, and uh, so uh, you've got to get him at to the luncheon tonight. It was over at the loft. So we went in, and they had the programs out and had John Popham's name on there and everything. He started reading, and I got them all, I got them away from him, and uh, I told Johnny, I said, you're getting kind of nosy, aren't you, bud? And so Johnny couldn't hear too well. That's right. And see, he, Johnny had, he did nine amphibious landings in the South Pacific during the war. He was a, he was a retired Marine colonel. And so uh, they, I told Johnny, the way I got him to the, to, the, to the presentation, I told him that the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs in uh, Nashville couldn't make it because of the weather, and I volunteered him as the speaker. So they called Johnny up to make, to make his picture as Veteran of the Year, and Johnny thought it was time for him to speak, so he just got up and started speaking about the American Legion and tell us how great the American Legion was, and there were 42 different veterans organizations there also. So uh, Johnny got the, got the award, and he, he, was, he was my adjutant while I was commander and, and a dear dear friend. I mean, he, he really was. Johnny was a r true American. Let's back up just a minute to you and another gentleman starting the Chattanooga Area Veterans Council. How, yeah. how did that come about? <clears throat> Brian Cook was the veteran service officer here in Hamilton County. He had an office up there in the state office building. And uh, back then, uh, we had the armed forces, uh, all the armed forces celebrations, the Veterans Day, the Memorial Day, everything was down at Patton Parkway. And the crowd got so big that I moved it out to the National Cemetery. And Post 14 had to, had to get the speaker. We had to get the, uh, the podium. We had to get... Uh, get uh, live electricity and the power board did that for us. The city furnished us a low boy. The Marines furnished the chairs. And we, we just, we did everything. And so Brian Cook called one day and he says, well, I said, you're putting on the program at 11 and VFW Post uh, 1289 is putting on the program at one. Said, why don't you guys get together and just have 
uh, one alternate every other year. So uh, evidently he called to Joe Murphy and Joe called me and he said, uh, what's 14 going to do? And I said, well, we're going to do it, Joe, if you're, if you're willing. He said, well, I'm willing. He said, that'll take a It'll take a burden off of both of us. So you consolidated. We, we consolidated. We started out with just the two of us, uh, the VFW 20, Post uh, 1289 and American Legion Post 14. And now then they have, uh, I think, uh, 43 different military organizations or veterans organizations, plus auxiliary organizations, plus... Uh, other other people that come in and report to us and they do the parade and then they do memorial day and veterans day under their umbrella i believe right. well people that do the do the armed forces week celebration now they have a separate committee i believe yeah it's uh it's a lot easier than it was when i had it i had to <laughs> I, I, did, I did the luncheon and i did the speaker uh, i did the flyover and i sold all the tables and uh, they now, Charlie Coolidge to, helped you sell some tables a little bit, didn't he? Uh, they they sold they sold tickets, separate tickets. And when he and Edith Atkins decided to turn it over, I said, "Well, Post 14 will take it back because we started it. We started the luncheon. We started the parade. So instead of selling individual tickets, I started selling tables. And and I didn't know who to call, so." Uh, being the city treasurer, I did know a few people in town, so I just called people that I knew. And uh, the, the banks and Coca-Cola Company and a lot of the uh, factories around here, I'd call them and they'd say, yeah, we'll buy a table. So uh, I wound up, with, I started with one person and we wound up selling uh, 65 tables. And you'd pack the silver ballroom and then the annex uh, part of the ballroom we did. too. Yeah, and it got so big that we had to move to the Trade Center. So, yeah. 1953 was the last time that we that we had it at the at the Reed House. Now, you spent a lifetime helping veterans. Why? Why veterans? Why has that been your passion in life? Well, it it was good to me. Uh, uh, I, I'm here for because of uh, the the veterans have. We do what we do in this country because of the veterans. And uh, I, I was just, I was one of them. It wasn't my choice. I got drafted in 1952 and, uh, you know, I, I was, I really wasn't eager to go. But uh, I was working in Wholesome Bread and I went up to the Crystal there at Main and Market and uh, on a coffee run about four o'clock in the morning, I turned the radio on and they were talking about uh, Korea on the radio. and. I got back to the bakery and I asked one of the guys, I said, uh, where in the world is Korea? And he says, he kind of laughed and he said, you'll find out. And so uh, I got drafted. Did you go to Korea? I did not. Uh, I was on a levy to go to Korea and uh, I, I was in, a, in the band and uh, the third army commander would go around to all the different uh, post in the, in the third army area which was in the south, southeastern part of the united states and and picked musicians and uh, i was at uh, fort rucker alabama before the helicopters got there and i was playing one night and he come over and said uh, uh, your your group really sounds good said if there's anything i can do for you well let me know and i said sir i i'd really like to go to fort mcpherson in in, in atlanta and that was like on friday night and tuesday i got orders and then I went up to um, Fort McPherson, and uh, that's where I met uh, Farron Young, and I, I played... Uh, We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. <laughs> well, I played... I, we, we did, uh, I'd say somewhere between 50 and 60 recruiting tapes. Yeah. And it was, it was our little group and uh, uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie Fisher. Yeah, Eddie Fisher. Did. Well, hang, hang hang on to that thought because All right. uh, I wanted to tell folks that there is another side to Carl Levi. Yes, he's a finance man, city and Hamilton County, but he loves music. Was in the band at Chattanooga High School. You could name a lot of people like Jay Craven was your classmate. All of these people you loved and knew, but you ended up playing a little country music. How did that come about? Well. <clears throat> Uh, Farron come over to the band one day and he said, I'm looking for a bass fiddle player. 
and we had nine nine or see we had a 128 piece band and we had nine bass bass fiddle players and and i just happened to run into him and i said you look familiar to me and he says where are you from and i said i'm from chattanooga and he says i said where are you from and he says i'm from nashville and he said i'm looking for a bass fiddle player and i said well you just happened to run into one and he said well you want to pick with me and i said what do you do and he says we, we do recruiting tapes and he said you all have a sound system here at the band and we don't have it over there in special services so i said sure i'll play with you and i didn't know that it would blossom into what it did and i, I heard from people all over the world that heard those recruiting tapes and uh, I, I was in uh, I, I was in a little cafe up in uh, Washington D.C. back in uh, 1957. And I ran into a fellow named Earl Gaston that that I played with, and I said, Earl, I haven't seen you since we got out of the army. Where you been? And he says, Well, I've been playing down in Australia with the Australian Jazz Quintet. So we we sat down and chit chatted, and of course I haven't seen Earl since. But but it did run into Farron at. Um, at Hundred Oaks when I was... You stayed in touch with him after you met him. Oh, stayed yeah. in touch with him most of the rest of your life, didn't oh, you? Oh, he tried several times to get me to come to Nashville, and I said, no, nah, I'm going back home and go to school, get me a day job, and, and try to make something out of myself. You mean you didn't want to go on the road and play? Hello, Walls. <laughs> oh, well... Hello, Walls. Hot things go for you. Today. The best little players are not stars, and, <laughs> and you know, Mother Nature and Father Time, they, they don't wait on you. you, you just get a little bit older, and I thought, well, I better get into something that I can build, so after I graduated from the university, I went to law school up in Tennessee for a year, and then uh, uh, I got called back in the Army. I, I had not been qualified as an artillery officer. I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So I came back and I was in the office with my, sitting talking to my dad and Mayor Ojadi came in and he says, boy, what are you doing home? And I said, well, sir, I'm, I'm waiting until uh, I can get back in school. I said, I need a job for six weeks. And he said, well, come across the street and talk to me. And I, I went over and sat down and talked to him about 10 or 15 minutes. And he said, go back there and tell him I said, put you to work. And that was my interview. And That was the city treasurer's office. Uh, yeah, and I went to city court. Oh, city court. Okay. I went to city court for three years. And Who was then, the judge? Uh, Riley Graham. Riley Graham, remember him. Well. And, and then uh, after city court, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the treasurer died out there in the parking lot, had a heart attack. And so uh, Mr. Zachary asked me, he said, uh, uh, Mayor Ojadi wanted to know if you'd like to be the, the assistant city treasurer. And I said, well, I'm going back to school. And he says, well, we got a job for you. See, I was making $300 a month, which was good in 1957. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know. He said, we'll give you an extra three, uh, extra $50 a month if you'll stay. So I, I stayed and, and I just, I stayed. And eventually, I, I was assistant treasurer for 17 years and then I was the treasurer for 25 years. Now Farron Young wasn't your only buddy in country music. No. You had another friend, RCA Victor Records. You see his name on a lot of the old records and CDs and so on. Chet Atkins. How did that come about? I was playing at the Chattanooga Golf and Country Club for the Engineers Club one, uh, one Christmas and we had, we had two different groups. We we had uh, we had our group which was uh, which was just a trio. It was uh, uh, tenor sax and accordion and bass fiddle. And then then they they had their band which was bigger. And uh, so we we alternated. So we we both took a, a break at the same time because they had a program and. So we went downstairs and they, they are giving away lobsters to the band. And uh, so, you know, usually people didn't think about the band, but they, they took us down in the kitchen and, and this, this man was sitting next to me and he said, uh, uh, I said, you know, you, you play really good guitar. And I said, uh, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Nashville. And I said, what's your name? And he said, Chet Atkins. Well, I never, I never heard of Chet Atkins before. Oh, come on. You never heard of Chet? Uh, not, till, not then. He wasn't famous. Oh. 
And so they got, I, I played with him the rest of the night because Lightning Chance was his bass fiddle player and he had the mumps and he couldn't come down here. So uh, Mr. Atkins asked me if I would play with him and I said, sure, I'll play with you. So you became good friends with Farron Young and Chet Atkins. But you also, there's another side of Carl Levi in that you're a jazz enthusiast. Names like Stan Kenton and Dave Brubeck and June Christie. I mean, the list goes on and on. Tell me about that. Well, <clears throat> there was a guy named Wenton Kelly. Uh, he was, he was a, a black man. He played tremendous guitar, I mean, pl a piano. And he played for Dinah Washington. And we were in the band together. And, and I had bought a 51 Chevrolet. And I was out there one day putting all, putting a headlight in my car and somebody come up and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hey Carl, I want you to meet the Diz. And I turned around, it was Dizzy Gillespie. Wow. And so uh, they, they were in, ta in town in Atlanta. He, he said, come, come hear me tonight. I said, it won't cost you anything, I take care of it. So it was Dizzy Gillespie and, uh, and uh, June Christie and Charlie Parker and uh, oh, what was the guy? That was Lionel that? Hampton in that group? No, this was. I met him later. Uh, who, who was the jazz, the the band that had very progressive music? Stan Kenton. Stan Kenton. It was their band, and they were all together there at, in in Atlanta. Did they let you dig out the bass and play with them? No, I just uh, I just listened. But you became good friends. Well, we got to know each other, and. Uh, then uh, my first American Legion convention, I went to Chicago, and I was walking down the street there, and, and I, I saw it said now featuring Dizzy Gillespie. So I, I went into this nightclub and I introduced myself. I said, "I'm I'm Carl Levi from Tennessee." He says, "I remember you, Carl." He said, "You was in the band down at Fort McPherson." I said, "Yes, sir, I was." And we we sat down. And he he was taking a break. We had a chit chat, and he said. Now Lionel is down the street at the Blue Note. He's talking about Lionel Hampton. So I went down to see Lionel. I didn't know, I'd never met him before. So I, I chit-chatted with him and I said, uh, the Diz sent me down to see you. He said, uh, you were a pretty nice fella. He said, well, I thank you. So we, we, we chit-chatted there for a while, so. And you had two upright bass fiddles. I did. And you sold one of them to Etta James's boyfriend? I don't know whether it was her boyfriend or her her common-law husband or what it was, but uh, yeah, he came out here and, and he, he there was a doctor here in town wanted to buy one for his grandson. And I had two. One of them, I bought it, it when I was a student at City High School. And uh, I didn't have any money to buy a bass fiddle. And I think it cost $275 down at Lansford Piano Company. And uh, I, I'd go by there at uh, by City High at uh, maybe 8 o'clock at night and rattle the front door and the janitor would let me in and I'd get the bass fiddle and I'd go play and then I'd come back about 1 o'clock and rattle the front door and I'd take the bass fiddle back down to the band room. Is this over on 3rd Street? Mm -hmm. This is on 3rd Street. And, and I'd, I'd lay a $5 bill on the bass fiddle. And, and I did that for maybe a year and a half and Finally, Mr. Casavant said, Carl, why don't you buy this? And said, you've, you've already paid for a year. And so I said, well, I don't have the money. And he says, well, your credit's good. So uh, gradually, I bought that bass fiddle that I had in high school. And then I took it with me down in Fort McPherson. And, and the other one belonged to Earl Van Arsdale. And after he died, well, Bill Thomason, who, was, who worked for me at the city, was uh, the delinquent tax attorney and he bought it from Earl and then with, with the understanding that I would teach him how to play the bass fiddle and, and I never did so uh, when uh, when the bass fiddle band come from California out here I said that one's not for sale but this one is and he said well they're both good so he took the other one and I, I sold it for fifteen hundred dollars so that bass fiddle very well was it in the band or the combo or whatever that backed up Etta James that did that Glenn Miller song at last? At last, right. <laughs> Etta James. A couple of million copies, yeah. Yes, sir. And it could have been your bass fiddle that played on that recording. I guess. <laughs> now, 
We mentioned the name earlier. Your friend, one of your best friends through the entire time that he was here, y'all were together, Jay Craven. Tell me about Jay. Jay Craven and I were, <clears throat> Jay was the uh, student band leader and uh, in the band, and I was the drum major and the band captain. And we used to go down to Howard High School and watch their band and I'd, I'd pick up things that the, the drum major would do and then I'd go back to City High School and I remember we'd line up behind the goalpost and, and when we'd start I'd throw my baton over the over the goalpost and then I'd, I'd catch it and go and do about my business. So uh, when, I, when I got in the army uh, I had a, a friend that I went to church with was the first sergeant of the 8th Infantry Division Band School at Fort Jackson. And he said, uh, I can get you in the band if you want to. And I said, beats Korea. So I, I went into the band school and he said, and so the, the band director there said, what do you play? And I said, bass fiddle. And he says, oh, you gotta do better than that. I said, I've been a drum major. He said, you teach drum majors. So I taught drum majors at Fort Jackson. And I graduated as a drummer, and that was my MOS. And I went to to uh, for, uh, Fort uh, 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 Benning. No, uh, the El helicopter school, Fort Rucker. Fort Rucker, Alabama. Oh, it was Camp Rucker then. That was before the helicopters got there. And I was part of the 47th Infantry Division, and uh, then I went to Fort McPherson, and. Uh, so with my name being Levi, uh, I told the band director that I was Jewish and I, I needed to get all the Jewish holidays. And he said, well, now you can't go home Christmas. And I said, well, that's all right. Well, he didn't know that I, I was booking bands over at Georgia Tech or the fraternities over there. So I, I, all, all, the, all the other guys went home for Christmas and Several of us stayed around and we went over to Georgia Tech and made a ton of money at Christmas time. Did Jay come down to hear you? No, uh, Jay didn't. Uh, there was a, a, a girl that, that I knew here from Chattanooga come down to hear me several times. But uh, but you and Jay did a lot of gigs around town, didn't oh, you? Oh, Jay and I played together for years, yeah. He loved him like a little brother. Jay was a good man. He, he really was. He, he was... Quite a quite a clarinet player. In fact, I think it was. I want to say it was Benny Goodman asked. That's right. To Be, come. He told me. He said Benny Goodman asked me if I would would, would come to work for him, and he said, uh, "Well, I need to talk to my wife, and because he had a family and everything was going pretty good, he says I'll just stay in Chattanooga." Well, Jay and Kathleen and I were in the same. We were at City together, and then of course. Andy Hagen was a little bit younger, but uh, trumpet player. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rafael Mendez wanted. Uh, he he thought Andy Hagen was a was a uh, one of the best trumpet players he'd ever run into. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've done veterans things all your life. Uh, you know, at ninety, where do you go from here? I just keep on plugging. I know you love to eat with your friends and tell these stories. Oh yeah, we we get together every every Friday at uh, at Wally's and uh, got the state uh, the immediate past state commander coming in tomorrow, and he and I are going to decide who gets a national appointment from Tennessee. Wow, that, that's my job, and yeah. I'm, I'm the I'm the liaison between the national and the and the state. Yeah, and uh, I have a a big list, and it it depends on who I recommend for a national appointment and I usually I try to spread it out all across the, the state and that's good and I try to give it to people that have uh, you know done something for the Legion I see there one more story that I want you to tell it has nothing to do about what we've talked about but you were raised in East Lake I was and you and your buddy used to go up and stop the Bachman tubes traffic so the <clears throat> produce trucks could get through. Tell yeah, me about that. Yeah, the, the produce trucks from uh, Florida would come through and they would come through on the north side and the north side had a dip in it. And they you know, they were packed sky high with with fruit and vegetables. And so 
uh, we would have one of us would park our bicycle on the east side and one would on the on the west side and the one on the east side would uh, he would stop the truck and tell him that there was a dip and you you can't get through there with this load if you'll give me your flag I'll I'll go through it the other side and we'll block the traffic so you can come through on the wrong side and so they would do that and then when they would come through we'd give them their flag back and they, they would give us a dime tip and at the end of the day we maybe made two dollars then we'd go down to Jimmy's cider stand and we thought we were big time you know and Jimmy was making cider and putting it in soft drink bottles and he had a little he just had a trailer down there where uh, where the shopping center is now and uh, he'd flip that back and we'd you know we'd have our thing and I had a little dog named Poochie and Poochie would would sit on the on the on the handlebars on the uh, the bicycle and, and some national magazine came through one time and and made Poochie's picture and I, I was trying to think who it was my sister was telling me I had forgotten about that well, what did the police department say about you but controlling the traffic through the tunnels oh they they didn't know about it <laughs> they didn't no we were just kids so yeah but to stop traffic like that that's pretty amazing well it, back then you could you know it, there wasn't as many cars on the road either so and then sometimes those trucks would come down later on I worked at the home store at the, at the foot of the of the, of the hill there at the 23rd and uh, and Dodds Avenue and uh, the trucks would get loose and they, they'd run into the beer joint or into the into the to the drug store into the to the store there the brakes would fail and so but th those were just some of the things that we did now that's your cuckoo clock going off and i believe there's a story behind that cuckoo clock in there yeah I, uh, you know I, I spent off and on five years in germany <clears throat> and uh, i went down to black forest one day and uh, I, I always wanted a cuckoo clock and so uh, I went to the factory and uh, I bought three and I, I bought one for my for my niece and one for a friend and one for me and that was the one for you playing on my darling Clementine yeah well what happened was see that that one you don't have to whine it's got a battery in it and uh, one of the batteries leaked and I had to have it worked on and they took all the German tunes off there and, and put that on there. So I, I said, I want it to play Edelweiss. And uh, but it doesn't play Edelweiss, but it works. And so. Where were you stationed in Germany? Augsburg. Augsburg, okay. The I, whole time? I worked out of Augsburg. It was the 13th uh, uh, Field Artillery. And uh, a, a, a fellow named. Uh, uh, Don Eckelbarger was the Corps Artillery Commander. He was a one-star. I was only a colonel. And uh, we, we got to be good friends. And so <clears throat> I, I was going over six or eight times a year. This was my last uh, five years in the National Guard. And uh, General Eckelbarger and I got to be good friends. So I'd go over a day or two early, and he had a dedicated helicopter, and, and we'd, we'd go sightseeing. And I saw more old castles on the on the river, and then I, I wanted to go down to Remagen, where the bridge fell. Mm -hmm. And my my friend Hugh Mott, who was uh, one of the generals in the National Guard, uh, got the Distinguished Service Cross there at the, the bridge at Remagen. So I went, and and the 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 end of the bridge is still there, and there there's a they made a tourist attraction out of it. And you'd go into this room, and there's this uh, television, and it's got all these German generals. And then all of a sudden, there's General Hugh Mott sitting there in his in his white suit and talking. So I, I got him a rock and bought him a book. From uh, <laughs> and uh, little did I know, Hugh, Hugh Mott and I got to be very good friends because he was the city treasurer and I was the city treasurer. He was a treasurer of Nashville, and I was a treasurer of Chattanooga so we, we got we developed a friendship there so uh, we, we went to Hawaii on a on a, uh, uh, a national convention and when I was running for uh, state commander uh, 
Hugh Mont got up one night and he said, I want everybody to vote for Carl. I said, uh, I spent a week with his wife in, in Hawaii and said, uh, uh, I, I highly recommend him. And her face turned by as red as your shirt. So, uh, he, he was, he, he was he just a real gentleman. And he, he was, he was a general. He was the, uh, the treasurer. And then he became the, the chief of police mm -hmm. in, in Metro Nashville. Well, Carl, I want to thank you for taking time out to spend some time with us. We could talk for a long time, but Ben's battery is going run out on this camera so I guess we better wrap this up. Well my battery's about run out too. Oh no so. you got a lot more time. <laughs> Thanks so much for spending a few minutes and sharing some oh, of your experiences. Oh it's a pleasure. Very pleasure. And from one veteran to another thank you for your service. Well thank you. It, it, I didn't plan it that way. Uh, it just it just happened. Well sometimes God has different uh, ideas for us so we just follow his plan. That's and, what I told the governor when they dedicated put my name on the armory out there I said he said why how do you think you rose to to the to become a general and I said with God's help God had a plan and, right. uh, and he there, followed there's, his plan. A, there's a big certificate right up there all right thank you Carl Levi my pleasure <laughs>